This video is brought to you by Manscaped. Uncharted and Nathan Drake are one of the most iconic faces in gaming. The face of the PlayStation going toe-to-toe -to -toe with titans like Master Chief and Mario, and its evolution from its original title of Project Big to Uncharted was nothing short of magnificent. Ironically, this series that has since its inception been associated with the phrase, greatness from small beginnings, has been over the top from its first entry. The second Uncharted then came around and did everything the first game did but better, and any wrongdoings were corrected. While Uncharted 2 Among Thieves isn't perfect, it gets respectfully close. A reasonable question to ask after receiving a sequel that topped its predecessor in every single way is, how can they do it again? How can Naughty Dog possibly make another game that not only improves upon its last installment, but dwarf it in comparison? Perhaps Uncharted 3 is the answer. Uncharted 3 felt like it was truly metamorphosing itself into the kind of over-the-top media it was once replicating. Everything from the tease set pieces to the actual Subway advertisement. Subway, where winners eat. I don't know how this happened, but it's amazing and I will die on this hill. I wish I could get a Subway sponsor someday, but for now, I'll have to settle for today's sponsor, Manscaped. Let's be real, boys. It's cold as hell out and everyone's working from home, and we're gamers. I get it. Sometimes you skip the deodorant or the shaving, but for your sake, and for the sake of everyone around you, freshen up, man. Thankfully, this video is brought to you by Manscaped.com, the global brand for men's grooming and hygiene products. Manscaped offers the best tools and liquid formulations for the three big odor zones, your body, your butt, and your balls. Ball trimmers, nose trimmers, ball deodorant, and tons of other goodies I didn't know I needed. The first thing I want to show you in the new Performance Package 4.0 kit is the Lawnmower 4.0 Body Trimmer. This is Manscaped's fourth generation electric waterproof trimmer with advanced safe skin technology, which reduces nicks and cuts on the most sensitive regions of the body. This Lawnmower 4.0 has a cordless charging system too, and these little LED lights on the front show you how much juice you have, which is super convenient, as is the travel lock feature. You even get up to 90 minutes of use with a full charge. Also included in the Performance 4.0 kit are two products I never knew I needed until now, the Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant and the Crop Reviver Ball Toner Spray, and they can keep the family jewels smelling and feeling fresh. Manscaped even has you covered above the belt too with their Weed Whacker Nose and Ear Hair Trimmer. It's a wireless nose trimmer with the same skin safe technology as a groin trimmer, so you don't have to worry about tugging or cutting on those sensitive nose hairs. For a limited time, you can get all of this plus two free gifts, the Shed Travel Bag and the Anti-Chafing Boxer Briefs, so if that convinces you, then feel free to head to manscaped.com by using the link in the description, and use code AQUA20 at the checkout for 20% off of your order with free international shipping, and start using the right tools for the job. Uncharted 3 Drake's Deception's marketing was a hype I hadn't seen for a release before, and from a personal experience at the time, it felt like everyone had been looking forward to the next adventure with our favorite Dude Raider. But then, the game came out. Praised by some, citing its score, set pieces, and gameplay as high points, and lambasted by others for its poor pacing, plot, and controls. It was clear that Uncharted 3 Drake's Deception would prove to be the most divisive entry in the series. It is this very divisiveness that warrants a look back at Uncharted 3. It's been 11 years since its release, arguably plenty of time to mull things over and come down from the high of your hype being fulfilled, and come up from the disappointment. From a personal standpoint, I'm worried about revisiting this game, because I loved it upon its initial release, and while I was significantly younger, I'm concerned with how this game will hold up under a critical lens. It's important to note that while I will be spoiling everything leading up to and including this game, if you would like to see my previous videos on Uncharted Drake's Fortune, a game that showed its age but was an acceptable nostalgia trip, and Uncharted 2 Among Thieves, a game that has a solid plot, some great set pieces and gameplay, but has a few fatal flaws, you can find them down below. For full context on my opinions, please refer to those videos. And now, let's take some time to revisit, reanalyze, and re-experience Uncharted 3 Drake's Deception 11 years later. Uncharted 3 Drake's Deception, while looking great for the time if played on the PlayStation 3, looks even better if played on the Nathan Drake Collection, which includes remasters of Uncharted 1, 2, and 3. I'm playing this on the remaster, so that's why this video will contain no mention of the multiplayer. I can at least say that what I played of it many years ago was fun, but wasn't something I returned to often, probably because all of my friends were playing COD instead of Uncharted. This entire video will be evaluating the remastered version of Uncharted 3 as it's the most accessible and honestly the best way to play these games. The remasters do bring in a few bugs that the originals didn't have, but the fidelity in the locked 60 frames per second makes a cinematic experience like this so much better. Uncharted tries to emulate a blockbuster action flick, and while gameplay reigns supreme in arguably every case, an argument can be made that presentation in Uncharted's case is marginally more important than it would be in any other game.
Uncharted since its beginnings has nailed the look of a blockbuster film. The explosions, dialogue, aesthetic, and by the second game they further blurred the lines between film and game. This time around I'd argue that this is no longer a game emulating a blockbuster film, but a game that is part blockbuster and notably feels like one. The camera angles here are far more dynamic, the score more ambitious, and it allows scenes like the opening where we see the sewer lids as the protagonists walk, informing us of our location to prove that it is the next step. Of course, with a game that has a budget like this, a subway budget, it's easy to tell that this is going to look better, but the art direction here also feels as though it evolved, though not to the point of losing its identity. We still get the same pull from the camera when climbing a large objective to take in the scope of our ascent. The castle walls from Drake's fortune, the train wreck in Among Thieves, and now in Drake's deception in moments like those when scaling the shipwreck instill that same feeling of being out of your depth. Uncharted 2 specifically made great use of camera angles and cutscenes, but here they make a greater use of different angles and shots both in and out of cutscenes. Uncharted 3 is also the most tonally diverse of the games in terms of environments. The first Uncharted focused on jungles and caves, with the second putting a greater focus on urban environments and snow-covered monasteries. Here we get a little bit of jungle, urban exploration in different locales, some cave rummaging, chateau raiding, and of course the third act of the game takes place in the desert, which is where the marketing would have you believe a majority of the game takes place. While you'll spend a majority of this game outside the desolate sands, the gameplay that does take place there utilizes the location to its fullest. The colors here are really incredible, and screenshot worthy. The way the orange and pink sky cover the grains in a light that blisters down on Nate's skin is scenery that the previous entries could simply not achieve something Drake's Deception does is further blur the line between gameplay and cutscene. While the previous entries had notable but non-intrusive transitions, the elegance in the transitions here were arguably to the game's detriment, as there were many points where I did not realize that a cutscene had ended and I was actually lagging behind. Now this is of course a problem with some, as Uncharted can at times seem like less of a game and more of a continuous quick time event requiring minimal inputs from the player. This is a sentiment present in every Uncharted game where the mechanics themselves are fundamentally shallow, but it's excused because the overall experience the gameplay, action, and story allow the product to be greater than the sum of its parts. The reason I bring this up only now is because with Uncharted 3's push to be the most cinematic experience yet, there are many points where there is a noticeable lack of control. There are still plenty of encounters that require button inputs and the like, but there are large portions and in some cases entire chapters that consist of just walking pushing the stick. I personally don't mind this because I can see what Naughty Dog is going for here, and their attempts at creating these movie-like moments resonate with me. But if you are looking towards the Uncharted games purely for gameplay, then I think it's safe to say you'll be disappointed. If you go into this wanting a cheesy action flick with explosions and buried treasure, then like me, you'll be satisfied with the series and the improvements made here. While variety in the locales is good, I've also enjoyed the variety in characters as playing as a young Nathan was one of my favorite parts of the game as a kid, and it is still an excellent flashback gameplay-wise even if it isn't as relevant to the plot as as it could have been. The rewards from before also return and allow you to replay the game as a number of characters from Elena to Sully to Twitter users and the list just goes on, and that doesn't even get into the other rewards here. It's something you don't see much of these days so it's appreciated even more for its scarcity. Levels also see you in a number of drug trips, which from both a plot and gameplay perspective got old very quickly. And I'll touch on that more later, but for now that's all that's new with the presentation, unsurprisingly. Fortunately the gameplay this time around, much like the innovations made to Uncharted 2, don't reinvent the wheel, but they do go a long way towards making Uncharted 3 the best playing Uncharted game so far. The gameplay this time around is as tight as ever, with almost every single kink present in the previous game's controls ironed out and with added innovations to boot. That's not to say it is perfect, but there were few moments in the game where the controls or the gameplay at all frustrated me. For example, if you remember, I criticized the bullet spread quite heavily in the first and especially the second Uncharted, for punishing a player that plays with accuracy and not allowing the player to shoot with much precision. Uncharted is as much an interactive film as it is a power fantasy, so having that fantasy interrupted by a bullet that decided to borderline curve around and pelt Nathan in the forehead Head was a point of contention for me. I'm beyond excited to share with you that the shooting here keeps its bullet spread, but it's much tighter, allowing for an inaccurate player to get lucky with a headshot or reliably shoot for the body, and a sharpshooter is able to feel unstoppable as they get headshot after headshot. I felt rewarded for my accuracy, and having such shooting in a game like this is even more important as Drake's Deception throws everything in the kitchen sink at you, both for and against you. There are a few new tools at your disposal here, but they just function as reskins of previous weapons. The Cal-7 is the AK, the G-Mal, the FAL, 
the M9 as the M4, and so forth. I don't really think Uncharted needs any brand new weapons, and whatever new weapons they did add would feel a little redundant anyways. As with previous games, you'll be swapping guns quite a bit to keep up with the limited ammo, and the ever-increasing series of enemies that are, again, nothing new. The brutes with shotguns, basic enemies, snipers, riot shields, they are all here. What stops them from feeling boring or repetitive is the context in which you fight them. Hanging from the vents of a broken-down military ship, from the cargo of a plane, in the cover of a sandstorm, you are always shooting in interesting scenarios. The enemy placement, though, and the sheer amount of them can be a little frustrating at times, especially when considering how loud this game can be. Enemies are often trying to get behind you, which is quite smart, but they seem to be near silent when moving. And factor this in with the soundtrack that, while masterfully made, is booming in your ear just under the thumping of the bullets, and enemies can sneak right behind you without you even seeing or hearing them. When you're on normal difficulty, this is fine, but on harder difficulties, it means an enemy can kill you before you have time to process what's happening, let alone turn around and do something about it. This doesn't happen all the time, but when there are multiple enemies rushing you and others shooting you from afar, it can feel like you have no room to move. And this becomes trickier when the enemies have armor that practically absorb the bullets. There are just some areas that don't feel like they were built for this many enemies. To explain that further, let's look at a new enemy variant. I know I said there wasn't anything new, but I lied, because these enemies show up for about one chapter, and that's it. The new foes, named the Jin, are just normal soldiers, but instead of dying, they power up with flaming heads and the ability to teleport. They also get the ability to throw napalm grenades at you, which function the same as a grenade launcher does. When they are damaged enough, they'll progress into their next phase, which makes them stronger and even more aggressive. Uncharted is more or less a cover shooter. Sometimes it's actual cover, other times it's a ledge you're hanging off of, or a vent you're climbing, but in most Uncharted shootouts, there is a large amount of cover. So this is why I'm dumbfounded as to why the game insists on putting six of these enemies in a room with less cover than normal and giving the enemy the ability to near instantly teleport behind you and throw a napalm grenade at you, which can't be thrown back like other explosives, which forces you out of cover. This from a design perspective just doesn't make sense to me because there is no trade-off. It's not like you're forced out of cover but you are given something that turns the ties back in your favor even a little. It's just an enemy that flat out ignores the fundamentals of the shooting. It doesn't even factor in their increased damage which can eliminate you very quickly after you leave such precious cover. You might be able to argue that they give you a lot of explosives in these cases, which is true, but when the enemies can freely teleport away from said explosives, your best bet is to try and get a direct hit on them with a grenade launcher, which will cause an instant explosion instead of the usual cook time. And good luck with that. Even then, you have to hit them twice to finish them, and this particular enemy took upwards of six shotgun blasts point blank to go down. I know that this side rant isn't very relevant in the larger picture, as you only fight these enemies for about 20, maybe 30 minutes of gameplay, but it doesn't excuse an enemy that felt like it was designed to be as counterintuitive as possible. A potential remedy would be to just make the enemies weaker. Not in the amount of damage they do, but in the amount they take. Turn them into glass cannons. This can make your ideal way of defeating these enemies the run and gun method, which is how you dealt with the supernatural enemies in Uncharted 1. Nathan Drake's Origins plays a large role in this game's theme, and having supernatural enemies that are reminiscent of the supernatural enemies within Drake's Fortune, his first on-screen outing, would fit in with this theme. There is also one more variant of enemy, but they don't play a role in the gunplay. But rather rather than now more in-depth melee combat. The hand-to-hand -hand combat here features a few new elements like grappling and environmental attacks. If you grapple an enemy, you can either pommel or throw them. Throw them into a counter with a bottle, and you'll end up smacking them over the head with it, shattering it on their skull. The objects you can interact with will be tough to distinguish from the environment, though. As in the kitchen of a bar, I assumed I would hit an enemy with a frying pan, which I did, but I also used a freezer door to take down a thug. I didn't mind these being a little difficult to find, but I don't know how many I actually found. I'd love to know which ones you found in the comments below. I know I saw one where Drake slapped an enemy across the face with a whole ass fish, which made me piss myself laughing, but I don't know what others there are. On the flip side, enemies can grapple you too, and you have to mash the circle button to break out. If another enemy approaches you, you can throw your legs up to counter them. The newest additions to the combat are the Brutes, who take far more hits and can take you down in seconds. A proper method to disposing of these mooks is just proper button mashing, much like everything else, but I think the variety here is somewhat appreciated. You may remember that there's a hand-to-hand -hand combat system in Uncharted 2, but there, there was little room to use it. I found that I was often in a position where I could maybe take out one or two enemies using hand-to-hand, -hand, but anything past that usually led to death. Here there are dedicated melee segments, and I think these go a very long way for replayability and variety in the gameplay. These were in fact some of my favorite parts of the game, because while the concept is very simplistic, it is still done well and achieves what it sets out to do. I also appreciated that melee is now a greater method of starting an encounter, as defeating an enemy that has a weapon will now allow Drake to, in slow motion, grab the gun mid-air and transition from melee to ranged combat on the fly. In the first Uncharted, there were two sides to the gameplay, the climbing and the gunplay. By Uncharted 2, we saw the introduction of stealth in very specific contexts, and now with Uncharted 3, we have dedicated shooting, climbing, combat, and stealth, and these gameplay elements intersect with one another far
far more than it has before. The stealth additions here aren't actually minimal, but the enemy layout and the use of certain environments makes stealth something you can rely on if you don't feel your shooting is up to par. The most significant change I noticed is that they actually give you a viable stealth weapon. In the previous games, for one chapter, you had the tranquilizer and it barely worked from any range beyond 5 feet, but here the silence pistol allows you to eliminate those in your way from farther away, which completely changes how stealth is approached. You now don't have to get uncomfortably close, though that is still an option, even from an elevated position as you can now dive onto someone and while this is quite noisy compared to your other stealth tools, this works better than dropping behind the enemy and risking being spotted. The enemies here are quite forgiving in their detection speeds, making stealth something I used a lot to both thin numbers and completely bypass encounters. This is further possible thanks to the layout of the stealth segments here. One of the most enjoyable was at the Syrian Citadel because of one small detail. Not only is this section at night, which can obscure your position, but all of the enemies have a flashlight around their waist and this is a genius way of giving the player the advantage as you can now see exactly where an enemy is looking. You can't tell their pathing and a careless approach will still render you spotted, but these lights act as vision cones for the enemies and it also means that we can see if someone is around a corner seconds before we're forced to make a decision. Of course what's best about this is that it's completely optional. Almost every encounter in this game can either be done loud or quiet, and while these days it feels like every game takes this approach to scenarios, seeing it here is still appreciated. The movement here hasn't been mentioned because there is no notable changes so far. I do think that there's a strange amount of inaccuracy this time around. For example, every time I tried to step on top of the front of a car, I would perform the step up and then Nathan would jump off, and I could not figure out why this happened. There were also certain camera angles that made the distance you had to leap seem greater than your limits, but they weren't, they just looked that way because of the perspective. Certain things like Nathan not grabbing onto ladders mid-combat can be pretty frustrating, but it didn't happen enough to ruin the fun for me. When the movement did work though, it actually felt the best and most fluid here. So while these are minor bumps in the larger journey, they're bumps nonetheless. But of course, we aren't here for the mechanical depth, and you guys know by now that the real bread and butter of this game is the set pieces, and man do they deliver here. I think there's a sense of deja vu when it comes to the scenes though, such as riding on horses to get to the front of a convoy. This time instead of jumping from car to car, it's horse to car, and instead of trying to save Schaefer, it's trying to save Sully. I can acknowledge that this is a very similar concept to the convoy in Uncharted 2, but it does enough differently like the near opposite color palette that swaps ice and snow for sand and more sand, and of course the introduction of horses aesthetically does make this feel different but mechanically it isn't. Of course the convoys here don't even hold a candle to the cargo plane which sees you fighting a brute on its open backside, eventually hanging on by the cargo itself and then being sent into the desert sky, only to be saved by a near supernatural stroke of luck. There are so many ridiculously dangerous situations that Nathan Drake gets into that it's almost strange when they don't happen. When climbing a pipe outside of the decaying chateau, I was more surprised that the pipe held rather than breaking like nearly every other pipe in the game. Granted, this is the only object to not be borderline disintegrated in this chapter, but either way I think an argument could be made that the moments of a piece of the environment falling apart as Nathan climbs on it are too numerous, but even when a handhold broke as I expected it, it enforced a feeling of danger, even if that danger is scripted. Uncharted 3 is again a linear game, but I will admit that Uncharted 3 in some scenarios takes the training wheels off even if barely. The aforementioned ways you can attack a room with stealth or a loud approach is just one of the ways, but there are also more linear moments too, like in the desert. I find it funny that the chapter that sees Drake in the most open area he has ever been is the one with the most restrictions and invisible walls, feeling at points on rails. I don't think this takes away from the scenes though, as the desert chapter still stands as a highlight because of its lead up and its execution, which truly felt ahead of its time. The thing that makes Uncharted 3 so much better than the previous games from a gameplay perspective is just how much variety there is. You're not in the same locale for very long and things move along very quickly. While I did appreciate the more low-key moments in Uncharted 2, like the jaunt through Tenzin's village, the consistent action here is more enjoyable in my eyes. I play Uncharted for the explosions, the climbing, the danger, and this game just doesn't let up on that. The puzzles make a return here and fortunately, I think they're the best so far. They won't stump anyone rubbing two brain cells together by any means, but I think the fact that it took more thought than simply opening your notebook for the answer is a step in the right direction. Furthermore, the execution of these solutions is short, so unlike the previous entry, you won't solve a puzzle in a few seconds and then spend a minute executing its solution. Using the light to cast a shadow on a portrait in Yemen was one of my favorites, and while it can be brute forced by trial and error, this perspective puzzle was more interesting than the usual suspects of turning a statue to face the right direction, which does show up here in the early game. Thankfully, the puzzle following this one sees you deciphering which symbols belong to what part of a grid, and it was an interesting way of using the environment to figure out a solution, having to stand on different parts of the floor with your torch to illuminate a different symbol. The puzzles are also 
also rare, so if you don't like them, you won't be forced to interact with them too much. The other portion of Uncharted 3 that is far better than its predecessors is the lack of any real boss fights. There are some here, but they function more as quick time events than anything else. And while on one hand, I think removing something rather than fixing it can be a bad thing, in Uncharted's case, it led to a more consistent experience. Navarro and Lazarevich were some of my least favorite moments from the first two games, and they made the endings feel underwhelming compared to everything leading up to that point. Here, Talbot is the most notable boss fight, and it truly boiled down to a quick time event, and that works a lot better than the previous games, even if its potential is minimal. Something that made the boss fights and a lot of the portions of previous games more enjoyable was their plot significance. You wanted to kill Lazarevich because he was hell-bent on domination and threatened the lives of your friends. Moving through the train wreck in Uncharted 2 was fun because of everything that led to that point, and seeing the betrayal that Drake faced to get there. Before I go any further, I will concede that the Uncharted stories have never been high art or even that good, to be frank. The stories in my eyes were a means of moving you through the different locales, and it served its purpose well. Uncharted's characters, on the other hand, was where the strength lied. I also know that myself and many others don't play Uncharted for its story. And with that being said, we should talk about the plot. And, oh man, it's, it's kind of shitty. The narratives in Uncharted have seen far more criticism and praise than its gameplay, which I've always found confusing. But digressing, I don't think I've seen many people praise Uncharted 3's story on the whole. That's not to say there aren't things to enjoy about it. There are. But it feels as though Drake's deception works surprisingly well on a microscopic level. Analyzing individual moments proves that there are moments of brilliance and fun, but it's when you look at the story as a whole that you notice the bigger picture isn't a pretty one. The plot begins with Nathan Drake and Victor Sullivan, two years after Among Thieves, meeting at a bar in London to sell Sir Francis Drake's ring to a man named Talbot. After Talbot attempts to give them forged pounds, a brawl breaks out, with a man named Cutter eventually shooting the two in front of both Talbot and a woman named Marlow who takes the ring and makes her escape. As the two are presumed dead, we get a flashback that explains the origins of Nate and Sully's relationship, and their rivalry with Marlo, who much like them, wants the ring. When we exit the flashback, we see that Cutter, or Charlie, was actually working with Nate and Sully, and the murder was staged to fool Marlo, and Nate was also wearing a fake ring with the real being in his pocket. Meeting up with Chloe from Uncharted 2, the crew follow Marlo into the underground, and discover that the artifact in her possession that when paired with Sir Francis Drake's ring can decode clues to the lost city of Ubar, or the Atlantis of the Sands, the team receives their next clue. With a map in possession that shows them the location of two artifacts, the crew splits up to acquire them. After a long run-in with Marlo and a broken leg from Cutter, Charlie and Chloe decide to back out, feeling it is too dangerous. Sully and Drake move forward on their own and head to Yemen to investigate further thanks to their old friend Elena. At least, Sully's old friend. Before Nate and Elena can argue too much, Drake is drugged by Marlo and then kidnapped by a pirate named Ramses. He also finds that Marlo has kidnapped Sully as well. Drake then wakes up on an abandoned shipwreck, moves through the troubled waters, and eventually washes up in Yemen, tracking down Elena and devising a plan to rescue Sully. Intercepting a cargo plane that is meant to deliver supplies to Marlo's crew who are in the desert closing in on the location of Ubar, Drake ends up tearing it apart and wanders in the desert before barely being saved by a man named Salim, who doesn't want Marlo to get a hold of the powers within Ubar. And with a common goal, he helps Drake rescue Sully, and now the two reunited head into the city. Drake is unfortunately drugged once again, separated from Sully, and after moving for Further into the city, they encounter Talbot and Marlowe attempting to pull the cursed treasure from the depths of Ubar, but Drake is able to thwart these plans. As the crew is escaping, Marlowe falls in quicksand, and despite Drake's hesitation, he tries to save Marlowe but fails, leaving Talbot enraged. Nathan is then forced to defeat Talbot before escaping with Sully, and a few coins to spare. As the crew is preparing to head back home, Sully explains that Nathan and Elena should give their relationship another try. Nathan listens to his old mentor's advice, and that's where our game ends. So, you may have noticed that there were a few details I didn't mention in this summary, and that is because there is little reason to even mentioning it. That's not to say they aren't interesting, but rather that the interesting details feel overshadowed by the more uninteresting points that are front and center. For example, let's look at the villains and the secret of Ubar. As we progress through the plot, we learn more of Sir Francis Drake's journey to Obar for the Queen. We learn that for some reason he abandoned his adventure, and left warnings for anyone wanting to accomplish what he refused to. Figuring out what he discovered and why he felt the need to not pursue it was far more interesting as a side plot than the main threat, which was Marlo and Talbot. Marlo wants the treasure because she is part of the same secret civilization that Sir Francis Drake is part of, one that lacks much depth or detail. She also wants to do it because she wants power, and I can assume a further motivation is to stick it to Nathan, who has been a thorn in her side once before. 
before, and judging by some of her actions, she clearly enjoys beating him and Solly. Petty motivations aside, she doesn't really pose much of a threat, and the same goes for Talbot. The only way they get the drop on Drake is when using drugs, and they make it very clear that they don't want to kill anyone. Marlo states at the beginning of the game that she does not want Sully or Drake dead, and this removes all danger from her character. For comparison's sake, Lazarevich was an actual threat, even if a boring one. He was prepared to kill people, and he did when they got in his way. Flynn, while being a less intimidating rival, was charismatic and was the kind of douchebag you enjoyed hating. Talbot does the exact opposite. Talbot does very little and in many cases says nothing, just giving shit-eating grins and condescending head nods. Furthering my general annoyance to the character is a lack of threat and the fact that the only time the villains get a leg up on the crew is when a hallucinogenic dart flies in from off screen thanks to Talbot. Talbot as a character, on the whole, is actually awful. On multiple occasions he is in the perfect place to thwart our plans and again has no established motivation or personality for that matter. He also genuinely has plot armor. This is most noticeable during the Citadel scene where on one occasion he poisons and speaks to Cutter without anyone noticing and then literally disappears. Not in a Batman like jumping off the roof to a safe place, he literally walks into a dead end and just pieces out. He's gone. How in the world? I can't make this shit up. Later on, Cutter gets a shot at Talbot, and we see it connect, but then minutes later he's perfectly fine, and Charlie even says, I know I shot him, but it's never explained. Talbot in Yemen is seen teleporting on multiple occasions, and I could go on, but I think you get the point. There are plot inconsistencies, and then there's this, and Talbot is in a league of his own. Talbot is just a lapdog of Marlo, who doesn't fare much better. Much like her lackey, she has a pretty minimal backstory and never does any of the dirty work. I like that while Lazarevich was on the generic side, he got his hands dirty, making him a direct threat. Marlo is an indirect threat, as she can't do much to hurt Nathan, but her Matrix clones of men in suits can. She also isn't very present in the game, as again, Talbot is the one doing most of the work, and as established, he's not doing a very good job. I wish I had more to say about the primary antagonist here, but there's just nothing to chew on, and that goes for a lot of the characters, including Chloe. I liked Chloe's return, but she doesn't do much aside from offering admittedly funny dialogue. Morning. Not worth the price of admission, folks. The same goes for Cutter, who might be one of my favorite characters in the entire series because of how genuinely funny he is, and his little quirks like his claustrophobia was a great way of filling in the downtime and developing him. Unfortunately, for as minimal as my thoughts are on these characters, that's not the worst, as Salim is almost purely a plot device, and again has nothing really to analyze. To clarify, I know that the side characters in the other Uncharted games were no showstoppers either, but the difference is that those side characters had redeeming qualities that allowed me to move past any issues. But here, there are no qualities, as it feels like nobody aside from the main three, Nate, Sully, and Elena, get much screen time. I can at least say that those main three get some decent enough development, or at least that would be the case if they didn't completely retread the plot of Uncharted 2. By the time Uncharted 3 rolls around, Nathan and Elena are split up once again, and bicker amongst themselves until eventually working together and realizing that they still care for each other. It worked well in Uncharted 2, but here it loses all of its impact because it's almost beat for beat what happens in that game. With no new twist other than their relationship has now evolved from dating to engaged, perhaps married. I do like the theme of Elena, while critical of Drake's habit of getting into life-threatening treasure hunts, actually loves it just as much as he does, as does Sully. Sullivan this time around is showing his age. Elena and Sully both think he's just getting too old for it. This, again, doesn't really go anywhere, and they actually hint at Sully dying on more than a few occasions, but nothing comes from it. Another thing the game touches on is Nathan's strange obsession with hunting down treasures, asking if it is because he feels as though he has something to prove. I can appreciate this angle, but again, nothing happens, and I feel like a broken record, because when a game has no depth, an analysis can't get very far either, unless I analyze every single piece of dialogue, which other YouTube YouTube channels have done already. Perhaps the game could have explored Nathan's obsession through the means of wanting to do something exceptional. Maybe Drake knows that his upbringing wasn't the best, and that his parents pretty well abandoned him. And maybe during his time as a child he always felt that he wasn't good enough, leading him to developing this obsession with superiority and being like the historical figures he idolized, journeying across the world to find treasure. But I think I'm just looking too far into this. As of where it stands now, it feels like there are a million plot threads within this game, and they all don't go very far. Even the finale here felt underwhelming compared 
compared to Shambhala. Ubar, while large and architecturally grand, felt it didn't live up to its mystical description. Not only that, but we don't spend much time in this location, with the game wrapping up this portion and the entire story quite soon after your arrival. It just felt like the team hit all their set pieces that they could, then they just ticked the boxes for the ending. Sully saving some coins, Nate and Elena getting together, and the bad guy dying, and then they said, Okay, we're done. I wasn't expecting an epilogue, but I would have liked to have seen something else. Like what the plans are for the future, but I guess the games have never really done that. Now, that's not to say that the story here doesn't have things I, and I think others, can enjoy. For one, at a conversation-by-conversation -conversation level, the writing here is great, and quite humorous at times, too. Moments like Cutter explaining why his cell phone isn't working while not making a ton of sense in the grand plot at least gave me a chuckle. We've been trying to reach you for over 24 hours. Oh, right, I need to top up my minutes. You're using a prepaid phone? Mate, those contracts are a complete ripoff. I also appreciated some of the more subtle things within cutscenes, like when Mark Wahlberg and Tom Holland share some food, and Nate reaches for Sully's beer, prompting a subtle cackle from him. You're a crook, right? <laughs> Other scenes with Spider-Man and Boogie Nights are just as fun and do offer some entertainment value on their surface, but not much beneath it. Marlo's reaction to Nathan giving her a fake ring prompts her to make the same hand motion Nate made to her many years ago, when he first duped her, and this felt like a subtle way of showing that she remembered their interaction vividly, without showing another flashback. But again, I think when this is arguably the best scene with Marlo, it says a lot. I feel like I, much like everyone else, ripped into this game's story a lot, and while I do think it is justified, I almost feel bad. Uncharted 3 has some great moments in gameplay and some downright funny ones in its story, but it's held back by how lackluster the story is. The plot at a microscopic level works, scene by scene, but the greater narrative feels disjointed, and as harsh as it is to say, almost unfinished. While that does not hold back the gameplay, it certainly does prevent the product as a whole from being something truly spectacular. Uncharted 3 Drake's Deception as an overall product was actually quite good for me. The gameplay is easily the best the series has seen, and while it doesn't top the train sequence from Uncharted 2, there's a great consistency of high-octane action that swiftly moves you from one explosive segment to the next, with greater diversity in the environments and even quieter moments feel more refined and replayable. Yes, the story was not up to snuff, but I don't think that is reason alone to completely write off Uncharted 3. I see so many people claiming that Uncharted 3 is horrible because of how weak its story is, and I agree, the story here is the worst we've seen. But perhaps I'm in the minority of people who play these games for the gameplay. Especially once we hit the third entry, I stopped expecting a quote-unquote good plot from an Uncharted game. That's not to say you can't criticize it or want a better plot, but I just think that gameplay matters a lot more here, and I feel like there are times where I'm the only one who thinks this. I can at least appreciate the individual moments here that served as a lot of fun, and something to distract me from the likes of Marlowe and Talbot. Uncharted 3 feels like the realization of a movie mutated into the interactive medium, so while I can confidently say that Uncharted 2 is a better overall pack, I think this is a solid entry. I like revisiting the Uncharted games, but there's a good chance that when I revisit this one, I'll just skip the cutscenes and focus on the gameplay, where the game's arguably at the trilogy's peak. Hello everyone, thank you for watching this video, I appreciate it. Uh, I want to give a shout out to our patrons and YouTube members. Starting with the YouTube members, we have Lane, Daniel Latow, and Breeze Over. And when it comes to the Patreon members, we have Ben Conway, Bossian, Chiefy, Chris, Gonzo Gonzalez, Jake the Lemur, Mark Short, Pyrite, Ryan Hutcherson, Sean Bailey, The Gamer Lorian, Toyota Jeff, and Alphadnar845719. Thank you all so much for your support, it means the world to me, and if you guys want to see these videos up to three days early, catch them behind the scenes things like thumbnail sessions and scripts for these videos, then feel free to join the Patreon below. I appreciate how supportive you've all been on the uh, last few videos of mine, and I also want to say thank you again for 100,000. I know I said I would make a video on it, but I'm kind of struggling to do so uh, for some weird uh, personal reasons, but bottom line, I'm very grateful, and I Think, I think I say thank you too much, so I'm not going to bother uh, harping on about it. New videos to look forward to. You can expect a video on Sunset Overdrive in late March and also in late March, or potentially early April, you can expect a long boy that I will not reveal the topic of yet. So regardless, late March is going to be pretty big. Unfortunately, the first two weeks of March, you're probably going to have radio silence from me. But yeah, so that's all I'm working on. You can follow my Twitter down below. I would really appreciate that. That's where I can kind of give you updates on videos as they happen and all that good stuff. You can also join my Discord in the description if you want to just kind of shoot the shit about games. And yeah, Thanks so much to Sean for editing this video. His links will be in the description and the pinned comment where applicable. Thank you so much for all of your support, your time. I hope you enjoyed yourself. I love you guys, and I'll see you next time. Take care.